welcome to all of you who have joined us today for the first annual lecture on the laws of social reproduction. I'm Dr. Prabhakoti Shwaran and I'm a professor of law at King's College London. I'm also the principal investigator for an EU supported grant called the laws of social reproduction. As we all know, social reproduction is what makes human life possible. It encompasses biological reproduction, unpaid work, including domestic work, care work, subsistence work, the reproduction of culture and ideology, the provision of a range of services, social provisioning and voluntary work. And feminists have long sought to render visible this reproductive labor performed by women the world over. Indeed, there is a profusion today of feminist scholarship on social reproduction across various disciplines. And feminists examine social reproduction in a vast range of institutional settings, including the home, but going well beyond in farms, childcare centers, schools, hospitals, care homes, and so on. Like much of the scholarship, our project uses materialist feminist theorizing as our point of departure for studying reproductive labor. In particular, a group of us five researchers seek to make two contributions to the scholarship on social reproduction. We undertake a cross-sectoral study of reproductive labor in five sectors, which spans the market marriage continuum by looking at sex work, erotic dancing, surrogacy, paid domestic work, and unpaid domestic work. Our intuition is that despite their disparate nature, they are in fact uh, share a lot of significant similarities in uh, women's work across these sectors. So whether in terms of entry due to patriarchal failures, and their conditions of work characterized by high levels of stigma, considerable boundary work to justify choice of work and reduce bargaining power, or finally, in terms of exit from such work. Secondly, we also seek to demonstrate the law's key role in producing and entrenching the invisibility of women's reproductive labor. But we also examine the law's highly differential regulation of their labor through diverse legal fields, each with its own internal logic. So our goal is really to problematize law's jurisdictional boundaries over women's reproductive labor and propose an alternate regulatory matrix to further their economic justice. In the process, we hope to bridge silos amongst feminists and between social movements, build solidarity, and ensure that furthering economic justice for one set of reproductive laborers is not at the expense of another group. Now, needless to say, the pandemic has made visible this vast infrastructure of social reproduction that keeps society running, while also fundamentally restructuring the productive and reproductive realms. So to help us think through the renewed salience of social reproduction at our current juncture, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Kerry Ritich to deliver our first annual lecture on the laws of social reproduction today. I'm also thrilled to welcome Professor Bina Agarwal to chair and moderate our annual lecture. Now to introduce our speaker, Kerry Ritich is professor at the Faculty of Law and the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. She teaches and writes in the areas of international law, law and development, human rights, labor law, and critical and feminist theory. Her publications include Recharacterizing, Restructuring, Law, Distribution, and Gender and Market Reform, as well as Labor Law, Work, and Family, critical and comparative perspectives. She has also authored numerous articles, including most recently for the Leiden Journal of International Law and contributed chapters to books on the theory of international law, reimagining labor law for development and the governance of trafficking and forced labor. She has also completed a report for the Law Commission of Canada titled Vulnerable Workers, Legal and Policy Issues in the New Economy. Professor Ritich has been a fellow at the European University Institute. She has been the McKinsey King Visiting Professor of Canadian Studies at Harvard University, Visiting Professor at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, Visiting Professor at Sciences Po Law School in Paris, and Professor and Academic Director of the Center for Transnational Legal Studies here in London. Our chair, Bina Agarwal, is Professor of Development Economics and Environment at the University of Manchester, where she teaches part-time. Her path-breaking work on gender inequality in property and land and on environmental governance has had global impact. She pioneered the field of gender and land rights with her 1994 award-winning book, A Field of One's Own. In 2005, she also led a successful civil society campaign to amend India's Hindu inheritance law to make it gender equal. She has written numerous academic papers and 12 books, including Gender Challenges, 
a three volume compendium of her selected papers published by OUP in 2016. Now, Professor Agarwal has been the president of the International Society for Ecological Economics, vice president of the International Economic Association, and president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. She has held distinguished visiting positions at Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, and the NYU School of Law, where she taught inheritance law. Professor Agarwal's multiple awards include a Padma Shri from the President of India in 2008, a Leon TF Prize in 2010, the Louis Malices International Scientific in 2017, and the International Balzan Prize in 2017 for challenging established premises in economics and the social sciences by using an innovative gender perspective. Thank you so much, Professor Sritich and Agarwal for joining us today. And before I hand over to Professor Agarwal, I wanted to invite our attendees to please post your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom, uh, which is where we will be collecting questions for Professor Sritich. And in case you're tweeting, the hashtags for today's event um, are value unpaid work, value domestic work. Thank you. I now hand over to Professor Agarwal. Um, so welcome everybody. I, I really warmly thank Prabha Koteshwaran for inviting me to this event and for that warm introduction, Prabha. Um, I'm honored to chair this lecture on the visibility and value of women's work by Professor Kerry Ritish. Now this topic of course has long been of key importance and it is especially topical, I think, to discuss it in COVID times, um, given the growing evidence globally um, of the highly adverse impact of the pandemic on both women's work, paid work, and unpaid work. So um, I, uh, Prabha, suggested I make some preliminary comments uh, before this very much anticipated talk. So I will make five uh, brief comments. Uh, many of them will be more from an economist perspective, but this will be an interdisciplinary dialogue today. So first, consider the issue of visibility and value of women's work. Now, this is really a complex issue because some work we know is visible physically, monetarily, and statistically, such as wage and salaried work. Some is physically visible, but unpaid and undercounted, such as subsistence labor on family enterprises. And a large proportion is invisible. It's also un unvalued and it's uncounted. And this is especially the case with child care and elder care. <clears throat> so there's been a huge amount of discussion among feminist scholars on how to make women's work visible and valued in all three respects, physically, in statistics, and in monetary terms. So this, this is really uh, the first point. The second, of course, is that these efforts to make visible and value women's work, especially domestic labor, has a very long history. Um, the demand to make domestic work visible and valued was first raised as early as 1898 by Charlotte Perkin Gilman, who's a feminist economist, although I, uh, she wouldn't label herself so at that time. And in her book, Women and Economics, she argued for paying women for housework. Now, this was seven decades before the global campaign for wages for housework, um, when that gained momentum and with which we, many of us, are more familiar. Uh, and um, Selma James in 19, 1972, for instance, demanded wages for housework at the third National Women's Liberation Conference in Manchester in England. And from there, the campaign spread across UK, USA and Europe, promoted especially by socialist feminists. It also reached the United Nations. Um, so throughout the 1980s and 90s, women from both the global South and the global North lobbied the UN to recognize women's unwaged work in homes and in communities and also in, in, you know, in, in subsistence contexts. And I believe UN did pass some resolutions on this, but what we all know is that measuring time spent on care work is a key target in SDG 5 in the Sustainable Development Goals. But meanwhile, the, uh, the Wages for Housework campaign has continued. Uh, for instance, it, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many people know and, or participated that it called for a global women's strike on March 8 in 2000, and that mobilized women from across 60 countries. So this is, the, this is a question which remains, should women be paid wages for housework? And if so, how would we calculate that? 
So the, this is the issue of me measurement, I, I believe, is really of key importance um, in many ways. Firstly, just to make domestic work socially visible, uh, to assess its monetary value, and to get it counted as work in national statistics and national income accounts. So what economists have proposed uh, for long is time use surveys, both to make women's work visible and value it. Now, in India, I believe the earliest uh, such attempt was really made by um, Devki Jain, a feminist economist in 1977, and she did it for, few, for two states. But later, the CSO in India conducted its first large-scale time use survey in 1998-99 for six states. Um, and there the matter rested for a long time. And as we always do, we've been cribbing about the absence of data on this. So around 2012, a national level survey was proposed to be done. And there was a committee initially, um, well, Indra Hirve was a central member of that. I was initially a part of it. But after laying the groundwork, no data was actually collected. So it's only in December 2018 that a time use survey was conducted by the NSSO and was completed just last December. But the results are not out and are eagerly awaited. Now we know that time use surveys are expensive and difficult, especially in rural areas because women multitask. You know, you have childcare, you have animal care, you have other work. You see women with little children on their backs working, working in the fields um, in Asia and Africa and everywhere. And uh, so it, it is really a, a, a complex way, how do you, how do you allocate? Um, so if you think of farming as productive work and childcare as, as care work, but if you're carrying the baby on your back and you're actually doing field work, then it's, it's really um, hugely intertwined. Um, but globally, of course, now many countries have undertaken a time use surveys, including the US. Now, I believe time use surveys um, help in many ways. Of course, the most basic is just to make families, communities, and the state recognize how much work women do. But they're also key to assess uh, the undercounting of women's labor force participation rates. Uh, now, we know that in recent years, Indian women's low and falling uh, labor force participation rate has been very much discussed. And part of the low labor force participation has, uh, the figures are due to poor measurement. Um, the NSSO and census both undercount women's contributions, um, even to conventionally accepted what is accepted as productive work. In 1985, a long time ago, I published a paper in EPW pointing to three types of biases. One was definitional biases where only paid work is counted as work. So whatever, there was a definition and then there was small print, which most people would not read. Then there are respondent biases where male uh, respondents fail to report women's work for social status considerations. And then there's enumerator bias. But in, uh, in the 32nd round in 1977-78, the NSSO conducted a special module asking for probing questions. You know, and these questions were asked to, um, to household members who had reported domestic work as their primary status. So if one added what they got as a result to the existing estimates, in some states, you actually found a doubling of the labor force participation rates for women in states like Punjab, for instance. So, um, in fact, over the past four or five years, there have been many papers, um, by, uh, especially by economists, by Sonal Desai, by Kunal Sen, Ashwini Deshpande, and others, which show both, um, you know, which, which show using uh, NSSO data, which exists, and other data uh, to demonstrate that women's labor force participation would be much higher with better measurement through sensitively framed questions. Now, of course, that's not the only factor. I mean, there are, there are real reasons for women's labor force participation being low, which are also demand side factors, safety for work and all of that. But measurement is an important factor. But for giving monetary value to care work and possible payments to women, uh, time use surveys has become important tools. So several EU countries, uh, European uh, Union countries, for instance, now develop what they call satellite um, national income accounts using, um, using estimates which are derived from regular time use surveys. So my fourth point is that uh, time measurement is only a start. 
how do you give a monetary value to women's domestic work? Now, economists suggest two ways. Uh, one is what they call replacement cost of time and the other, the opportunity cost of time. So what are these? Um, replacement cost, one could say, is the market value of that work, such as wages uh, given to a full-time maid. But you could argue that since, um, you know, since d paid domestic workers are underpaid, uh, this will set a low value for domestic work. Opportunity cost of time is what a person would earn if she worked according to her qualifications. So say if a woman is a software engineer um, uh, and she stays at home for childcare and loses a high salary, her time would have a high opportunity cost. Now, of course, we know that opportunity costs would be very difficult to assess in practice, but I believe it's important to at least attempt a calculation just to show the kind of economic loss to families and countries um, when highly qualified women are forced to stay home because of social status. Some of this is, of course, we know changing a lot, but still, uh, it still exists. Also, monetary estimates demonstrate the scale of unpaid work in relation to wage work. Now, one person who's done a huge amount of writing on this is, of course, Nancy Fordbray. So I did want to flag her name here, and many of you would be familiar with her many writings. I, I must also mention that the distinction between paid domestic workers and women's domestic work in families is, in, is, is something that, that needs highlighting. I mean, I know you'll be discussing this in the coming workshop, um, especially in regard to the importance that domestic workers get decent wa uh, wages and security. But uh, I do want to raise a question. Can the same be done for unpaid care workers in the family? Because even otherwise, if we use wage rates of domestic workers to estimate the replacement cost of women's household work, um, a rise in wages of domestic workers will set a higher floor for fixing wages for housework. Yeah. So this is one of the other connections between paid and unpaid work. And my fifth point is, if care work is to be paid for, who will pay for it? Is it the employer? Is it... Uh, the state, the international demand, of course, has been for the state to pay women for household work. And some governments do have started paying caregivers for elder care. Uh, and paid maternity leave is also, one could say, a form of limited payment for child care. But let me also pose this question. If husbands begin to do more care work, would they be paid also? Uh, and if we went this route, of course, time use surveys of what, what men and women both do could come in useful. Now, I just wanted to remind ourselves that uh, Engels, in his, in his book, um, Family, Private Property, and the State, offered the most dramatic solution, uh, so-called solution, which, which is to socialize all housework. But we know that attempts to do so have failed. Um, you know, for instance, Israel tried communal child rearing in the kibbutz as late as the 1980s, and China in the 1950s set up communal meals. But both countries then returned these tasks to the family. So even in these countries, of course, the questions that we will discuss or the, or the issues that we are raising will be important and relevant. So let me conclude. Um, as you can see, much of the debate that I have covered on measuring and valuing women's work has been um, a debate particularly uh, among social scientists and special economists. Um, but it would be therefore very revealing now to get a legal perspective on this. And so um, I, as all of you, are eagerly awaiting Professor Kerry's uh, keynote. And so, um, Kerry, I would like to pass on the baton now to you. And thank you. And look forward very much to your talk. Pina, thank you so, so much um, for that unbelievably elegant and comprehensive history of all the efforts to value women's unpaid work. Um, um, you've given a lecture of your own already, so I'll, I'll merely uh, 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 try and add some legal footnotes to it. Uh, but first, let me uh, let me give deep thanks to uh, Prabhakoti Swaran for the invitation to participate in this fabulous project. Uh, I also want to thank Chazi and all the other people involved who've 
um, uh, um, made uh, uh, this event possible, as I think everyone knows. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, nothing in the realm of technology can be assumed to work, and there's been a lot of invisible labor uh, there as well. Um, okay, so um, as Bina has, has just described, uh, feminists have long highlighted the labor that we call reproductive, um, uh, 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 yet um, it remains hidden in plain sight, even as it's central to virtually all social, economic, and cultural life. Um, COVID is, of course, bringing some of these questions into view um, and to the attention of people who don't normally think about social reproduction. Uh, but I think this, the central issues remain are, that remain are the following. Um, why is it so hard to make this work visible? Um, how is it not the work that matters? And why does it materialize as an issue to be addressed only when it does seem to impinge upon the work that counts, namely paid work? Um, um, I think these are, these are the questions that we're all grappling uh, with from a number of different disciplinary standpoints. Um, and in a series of recent talks and papers, um, Nancy Fraser, whom Bina has already mentioned, attempted to locate the dilemmas of reproductive work in the crises and contradictions of capitalism, um, specifically capitalism's relentless drive to accumulate surplus labor. Uh, but she goes further and she locates um, uh, reproductive work at the center of the contemporary feminist agenda. Um, she and her co-authors recently put it this way, uh, gender oppression in capitalist societies is rooted in the subordination of social reproduction anti-racist and anti-imperialist must perforce be anti-capitalist as well. Okay, um, I um, completely subscribe to the uh, proposition that we're at a crucial juncture in uh, uh, the organization of economic processes and relations at the moment. Uh, uh, many, much of this is in full view. Uh, I also think there's absolutely no doubt that gendered hierarchies at work are deeply entwined um, and in some sense incomprehensible apart from histories of colonialism and practices of um, uh, uh, servitude and slavery backstopped by racism. Um, uh, but I'm going to come at this nested set of very large questions from a particular standpoint um, uh, I want to make the suggestion that we actually just dislodge and denaturalize uh, the distinction between productive and unproductive work that has uh, become so central to the way that we think and the way that we organize economic relations. Um, uh, the reason is simple. My sense is that if the task is the recognition and evaluation of the work of social reproduction, then our continued attachment to this distinction is now part of the problem. It's as much a burden as it is um, a benefit. Um, uh, why? Uh, because the distinction detaches many of the dilemmas of social reproduction from some of its important roots in the productive economy. Uh, the two are joined at the hip, as, as, as we already know. Um, um, and uh, I think this investment in separate domains risks um, actually supporting the very practices um, that we want to disrupt and in many cases dismantle. Okay, so um, I share the certainty um, uh, that the organization of economic activity is critical to social reproduction, but I wanna go ahead and go further and trouble this distinction um, itself. And the premise I'm gonna operate on and, and I'll try and explore through um, a discussion of its legal infrastructure is that not only are reproduction and production deeply entwined, uh, but the differences between them are as much made and found, um, and uh, 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 they are made and found in a variety of ways. Um, Bina has just rehearsed some of the critical economic practices which contribute to this boundary. I'm going to suggest that law plays a very important role as well. So um, I want to reflect on how we make reproductive work. Um, how we uh, value and devalue it um, uh, through law. Um, and I want to um, uh, just uh, suggest four basic uh, 
propositions or properties of law, uh, and by extension, four ways of uh, thinking about law as a path to exploring how we make and value, uh, distinguish, and in fact, change uh, the spheres of production and reproduction. And I'm gonna take a quite broad definition of law. Um, I think that's critical. Um, and my sense is that there are very interesting um, and possibly productive um, parallels um, uh, with this, between this investigation and the work that um, scholars in other fields uh, are doing, um, sociologists, economists, um, uh, and so that it might provide a natural bridge to interdisciplinary work. And of course, I think it's also critical to thinking clearly about um, uh, strategy for change on the ground, um, what our political possibilities are and how we might frame them. Um, let me set the stage a little bit by uh, just uh, talking about the transnational landscape around development and gender empowerment. Um, um, and I'll speak briefly to uh, the international um, initiative to regulate domestic work as well. Okay. So um, I find it not just helpful, but actually essential to situate um, uh, all the questions, the consideration of the possibilities around uh, social reproduction within current visions of um, development and their associated uh, projects. Um, and um, just to flag one of their central characteristics, um, I see this as a landscape in which um, um, more and more entrepreneurialism um, is imagined as the path both to social progress and to economic uh, uh, growth. Um, uh, I don't think this will be news uh, to anyone who works in the field of development, but planners and policymakers um, at every level, uh, domestic and international, are now filled with dreams of turning their citizens into high value uh, market actors, um, uh, or at least entrepreneur, entrepreneurial workers. Um, this is all part of the aspiration to foster development um, uh, by the integration of um, both populations and national economies into transnational circuits of production, investment, exchange, and consumption. Um, um, and as I think many people um, in this audience will also appreciate, empowering women and the feminization of um, labor market work are at the center of these dreams. Um, uh, so that's part of the story. Um, but the other thing is that um, uh, for the last couple of decades, um, these same people have sought to address poverty and other social um, uh, uh, dimensions of development, as they are usually called, um, through quite distinctly market-centered techniques, uh, such as formalizing labor markets and empowering the poor through financial inclusion, microcredit, and um, various extensions of the rule of law. Um, and this um, uh, feminism and formalization of work, um, of labor, um, is, uh, we are told, uh, both the catalyst to gender equality and the royal road to modernization, the way to increase uh, growth at the same time as uh, reducing dependence. Okay, so what we have going on is a kind of reciprocal socialization of development and an and economization of social objectives like social welfare and social justice uh, through these market-centered uh, projects. Um, Here's the issue as I see it. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, this has problematized the work of social reproduction in really central ways because behind the entrepreneurial woman um, uh, um, is an enduring image of the unencumbered worker. Um, uh, what do I mean here? Um, the shadow expectation is that women now too, uh, uh, like men, are presumed to do, uh, 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 will direct their primary attention to their paid work and that uh, reproductive work uh, can and will be subordinated to market work uh, with any necessary reproductive tasks arranged through some combination of family labor um, and uh, uh, perhaps purchases of market service. I think there's a degree of magical thinking in all of this. Uh, uh, um, and I, uh, I wanted to just suggest some of the contradictions or risks here. Um, 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 
Oh, one more thing it's worth saying, um, you always have to pay attention to how these projects get operationalized. And there really is a common set of legal strategies organizing uh, these projects on both the economic and the, and the social set, um, divides. And that is um, uh, more entitlements, more empowerment of the private sector. Uh, whether the subject is gender equality or um, uh, increasing jobs or um, advancing innovation, this turns out to be the central core of the regulatory project over and over again. Okay, just a brief illustration um, uh, uh, through the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the world's social project. Um, so one of the goals is um, uh, to recognize and value unpaid uh, care and domestic work through, and I quote, the provision of public services, infrastructure and social protection policies, and the promotion of shared responsibilities within the household. Okay, uh, here's another goal. Um, I think it's important to put these two goals side by side. Um, uh, goal eight aims to promote sustained, inclusive, and um, uh, sustainable growth and full and productive employment and decent work for all. And how is this gonna work? Well, um, uh, through higher levels of economic productivity, um, diversification, technological upgrading, innovation, through a focus on high value added and labor um, intensive sectors. Um, and second, promote development oriented policies that support productive activities, decent job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity and innovation, encourage formalization and the growth of micro, small and medium enterprises, including through access to financial services. Okay, so notice that the engine of social progress, namely the future of decent work, spins around this idea of absorbing more and more people into high value, high productivity market activity. In other words, they're not supposed to be involved in the work of social production. Um, uh, I think that there, as I suggested before, some very unrealistic assumptions about unpaid work that travel with this vision. Um, the idea that, you know, uh, reproductive work, well, you can manage that as long as it's shared and maybe that there, maybe there should be some compensation through the state as well. Um, uh, um, I, I think there are distinct risks that are probably not only um, uh, uh, possible, but are already materializing which is that um, the dilemmas of social reproduction um, that Bina has described, um, the undervaluation or non-recognition of this work will simply be aggravated. Um, of course, undercutting the promise um, that all this entrepreneurial activity is the road to gender empowerment too. Okay, so um, um, we've got a heightened visibility of women within the circuits of, of uh, global production um, that I see as both liberatory and uh, disciplinary. Um, on one level, the horizon of possibility has been reset. Women are supposed to be able to do all these things that formerly they didn't, but at the same time, women are being nudged, perhaps even coerced, into being more high value productive workers as if they weren't already engaged in massive amounts of work, which as Bina has described, is already undervalued, not recognized, miscounted, and so forth, even when it is recognized to make an important contribution to the economy. Um, uh, uh, in short, this vision makes the actual work that women do, uh, 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 um, uh, both within and on the edges of the household, uh, uh, much more difficult to see. Um, um, uh, Bean has rehearsed all the sort of conceptual and classification and taxonomic ch um, challenges that, that the valuation and the recognition of unpaid work can entail. Um, I'm going to um, just both invoke that and set it to a side and suggest that um, uh, we should actually put in question the uh, distinction itself and, and start to challenge more fundamentally um, uh, uh, um, whose uh, projects and interests it serves. Um, and um, uh, the more I think about it, the more I, uh, uh, and the more we all think about it, I think the more obvious it becomes that there are many, many contexts in which it's simply 
unworkable as a description of the working worlds and the working lives of people. It's not a good way to divide up uh, a productive activity of any kind. Um, so uh, the point of entry here uh, is that there is actually no natural, necessary, uh, non-normative or transhistorical uh, distinction between production and reproduction. Um, it sometimes tracks the distinction between household and market labor, but as, um, as we know, um, that's not invariably true. Um, uh, domestic production and reproduction don't refer to uh, uh, fixed domains um, or social spaces, and they don't encompass particular tasks. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the classification matters only, I think, uh, uh, insofar as it contributes to how work is organized and how it is uh, 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 how its burdens um, and benefits get distributed. And as we know, the track record so far is really poor. Um, um, so uh, uh, feminist economists and sociologists have, I think, made an ironclad case for the extent to which production and reproduction are functionally entwined. And they've also observed uh, uh, how sticky gender norms in respect of unpaid work can be. Even when women are engaged in market work, uh, uh, they often continue to do much or most of it. Um, so what might a legal scholar have to say about this picture? How might we contribute to unpacking it um, here's where I would start, uh, simply with the observation that the disadvantages we associate with reproductive work are not uh, natural or inevitable. Uh, uh, we make them in part through law, um, and in fact, we make the distinction itself um, through law and policy. And I think uh, we're at a point in which we should insist um, and engage in efforts not only to value care work, but actually to flip the lens. Um, and start looking at arrangements around productive work, um, uh, make them central to questions of reproduction and to how value is distributed, both in the realm of production as we know it and reproduction as we now know it. Um, and I think there are a few corollaries to bear in mind, um, and they're really, really important. Uh, one is that, that this means we have to resist the idea that laws and policies fall on either the economic or the social side of the divide, that we can identify ex ante what constitutes uh, some, uh, a law of social reproduction or a rule that bears on social reproduction and what is just part of the uh, economy. Um, uh, um, I think um, uh, the idea is put all these rules and policies in a common frame um, um, uh, and um, try and trace what they do and what the various categories do, uh, both within production and reproduction and in moving activities across that divide. Um, 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 so one way I think to do, uh, to engage in this exercise is to try and just make a list and to start noticing how much the present arrangements with respect of social reproduction are a function of prior decisions that we've made in law and policy. Um, and this is sort of the big general topic that I, I wanna get into just uh, 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 briefly by looking at a form of work that is both emblematic of social reproduction and problematic precisely because it does straddle the production reproduction divide. This is domestic work, which of course can both be paid or unpaid. Okay, so domestic work has um, uh, uh, features which make it notable. Um, it's huge. Millions of women all over the world do this work. Um, it's strangely invisible, despite the fact that it occurs within our households. We see it every day. Um, uh, uh, in law, it has special characteristics. It's a subject of legal exceptionalism. Uh, which I'm defining as normative and symbolic differentiation in law from other forms of work in ways that generate both material and symbolic disadvantage for the workers involved, right? This legal exceptionalism both contributes to and flows from the idea that domestic work is um, uh, uh, not real work. Uh, um, uh, um, and finally, the last thing to observe about it would be that it's quite degraded. Um, uh, it's a place in which 
uh, racial, ethnic, caste differentiation, um, all converges um, to produce um, poor terms and conditions. Okay, a few years ago, the um, International Labor Organization uh, uh, at its annual conference um, uh, uh, agreed upon a landmark uh, 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 convention to regulate uh, uh, um, such work, the Domestic Workers Convention. And the fundamental aim of this convention is, is, is pretty simple. Um, uh, it seeks to end the longstanding invisibility and exceptionalization of domestic work. Um, uh, by ensuring that domestic workers enjoy um, uh, basic uh, core labor rights and have access both to normal workplace protections as well as protections for the sorts of problems and harms that are specific to their work. Um, uh, 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 think of the uh, routine confiscation of passports and identity documents, which makes um, uh, some of these workers effectively unfree, uh, even outside their working lives. Um, very, very basic things are an issue here, namely even the entitlement to know the terms under which you're working. Okay, so the convention is, you know, both um, important and a portal into further thinking. Um, it's a victory at, at multiple levels, not least because of the incredibly uh, central role that domestic workers th uh, themselves played um, in its promulgation. By the way, um, there's a, a fantastic book by Adele Blackett, um, Everyday Transgressions, which documents this entire process. Um, yet, um, as even the proponents of the convention understand, um, domestic work is only partly regulated by formal law, um, uh, uh, with the real law found elsewhere in informal uh, codes of conduct, for example. So there are really basic questions um, uh, uh, um, here, namely, how much better off will domestic workers be as a result of this convention? Um, and one observation would be that that question turns on uh, many, many rules and policies and practices uh, that the convention itself does not touch. And it, this is where it connects. I would connect the conversation to things that Bina has already um, put on the table, namely, um, how would these arrangements, how does domestic work um, uh, uh, connect with other um, social and economic arrangements? Um, and how is it affected by, um, by workers' other income generating opportunities? So a whole raft of development issues. Um, 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 but the other thing, of course, is that the convention doesn't touch unpaid domestic work. Um, and like all on market work, it, it is, um, uh, that remains beyond the reach of labor law, even though um, uh, uh, it's well recognized that the degraded status of domestic work within the market is intimately connected to the longstanding invisibility or undervaluation of, um, uh, of care work um, outside the market as well. Of course, um, uh, also to the histories of slavery and servitude. Okay, so I think this is our issue. Um, uh, where are the rules regulating social reproduction uh, and what do they have to do with questions of recognition and value? And here I think we move into um, critically interesting and important questions about how to think about law. Okay, so uh, some basic critical issues. Um, uh, how to think about what law does. Uh, uh, a standard view uh, uh, about what law does in the realm of production and social reproduction would be this. Uh, it sets the ground rules of exchange among market actors. Um, uh, labor and employment laws, for example, modify um, contract rules uh, uh, um, by setting minimum standards of uh, um, uh, the employment contract, uh, whether, respect, uh, whether with respect to wages or hours. Uh, collective bargaining laws allow workers to aggregate their bargaining power in the hope that they'll get a better contract collectively than they would uh, if they were bargaining with their uh, uh, um, uh, employers on their own. Um, now, uh, there are other views about all these rules. 
uh, but uh, under the mainstream view, um, law is largely external to social reproduction. Um, uh, uh, the roots of, of uh, um, uh, the, uh, social reproduction and its status lie in political economy or they lie in culture, but law doesn't really have anything to do with it. Why? Because law doesn't directly regulate it. Okay. This picture looks quite different from the standpoint of uh, 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 a critical uh, um, uh, lens. Uh, many of these assumptions would be reversed. Uh, uh, and that's what I want to explore. Um, just some basic ideas. Uh, um, uh, by the way, I should just critical legal scholarship, if I use that term, is simply referring to uh, a fairly long tradition of legal thought, um, uh, largely in North America and Europe. Um, I think what makes it interesting and important for our purposes is that much of it was catalyzed by earlier moments of economic convulsion um, uh, uh, um, uh, and moments of market consolidation uh, uh, very much like the moment we're now in. Uh, so there's some um, analytic insights that were developed in that context, how to think about property and contract, which we mobilize now. Um, uh, and of course, there are lots of uh, contemporary legal scholars, as there are economists and soci sociologists working on questions of social reproduction. Um, um, uh, and among the things um, that are um, axiomatic uh, to our work are that um, law doesn't just set the neutral ground rules for interaction among parties. Um, they're central to the powers um, and lack of power that uh, uh, social and market actors have. And figuring out precisely how they empower actors is in fact um, indispensable uh, to uncovering and understanding the law of social production. Okay, another idea would be that law is also part of how we literally constitute the spheres of production and reproduction. Um, think of law as a somewhat independent variable in the political economy, um, uh, including the economy of social reproduction. Um, uh, they're how we distinguish, partly how we distinguish what is productive and what is reproductive, um, they're part of how we value and devalue different activities um, uh, and so forth. So uh, just think of law as providing a really critically important part of the infrastructure that uh, organizes the flows of resources across the productive and reproductive divide um, um, and that helps make um, any distinctions. Okay. Um, so let's try and distill this into four basic propositions about what legal reels do. Um, I think they'll help us open up some of the possibilities for thinking about the law of social reproduction, uh, where to find it, um, uh, what it does, and in so far as it does so, um, I, it will also help us think beyond the usual list um, of legal rules that we come to when we think about social reproduction, namely more labor and employment law, more human rights, um, maybe even more publicly provided childcare. Um, because I think it turns out, um, at least this is the premise I'm operating on, that many, many other rules um, are bearing on the distribution of profits, value, and so forth in, uh, in the reproductive world, um, as well as the productive world, in part because they're so to uh, tightly connected. All right, so uh, let's have a look at the um, uh, slide two, I guess. Um, let me see. Um, there we go, great, thanks. Um, okay, so one idea is that legal rules function as behavioral incentives. Um, they're not just norms backed by the power of the state, um, it's helpful to think of them as bargaining in endowments, um, a bargaining in the shadow of the law. Uh, parties are making deals with each other, they're settling arrangements about how things will work both at home and at work, um, uh, um, and uh, uh, thinking about who does what, who gets what, what they have to put up with, uh, where they can push back, um, and they're doing so with a view to what will happen um, uh, if they don't reach an agreement, uh, whether um, at home or at work, think divorce, think job loss. Now, here's the thing. Who's in a stronger bargaining position 
who can hold out for a better deal is not only a matter of whose uh, legal position in the employment dispute or the family law dispute will be upheld at law, uh, but it's also related to many outside options. Uh, at home, for example, if you have a domestic par partner, what do they contribute um, by way of labor and resources? That's all going to affect your decision. And um, similarly, um, if you're in a situation of bad work, um, can you generate income by other means? Um, do you have constraints uh, that will prevent you from taking different work? Do you have to live, uh, uh, look after the kids and so forth? Now, uh, the basic idea is that all of these options are themselves um, structured by legal rules. Um, uh, uh, and here's in some senses, um, Jassy, the next slide. Um, let me see if I can do this. Great. Um, legal rules um, are devices for allocating powers, immunities, uh, risks, benefits. Uh, we sometimes say uh, 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 legal rules generate distributional consequences. They have something to do with um, uh, the question of winners and losers, who gains and who loses by how much? Um, here's something that I'll just put on the table, although um, uh, it could be the subject of a longer discussion, and certainly I would want it to be with economists. Uh, and this is the idea that all factor endowments, um, uh, uh, everything that goes into production, whether it's labor or resources, are also legal endowments. What do I mean? Um, things don't have value in nature. They don't have value in the abstract. They have value uh, because of and to the extent of their legal recognition, right? So um, it's pretty easy to illustrate this in, uh, in fields like intellectual property. All of the value of intellectual property is a legal creation. It, there is no value in intellectual property apart from a legal creation. Uh, but this is an insight that is more generally true. Uh, and it's really important to social questions of social reproduction because without different forms of legal recognition, it's very difficult to make the value visible and make it count. And this is, of course, um, fundamental. Okay, um, so um, legal rules are devices um, uh, 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 to um, allocate powers and risks. Rules operate in the foreground and in the background. Uh, foreground rules might be things like, if you decide to become an entrepreneur, can you deduct the cost of your childcare as a business expense? Uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court of Canada in a case that signs decided no. Uh, similarly, um, do you have access to job uh, protected maternity leave? Uh, and is the time off work covered by employment insurance? This is gonna affect all kinds of things from the number and the timing of your children to perhaps whether you work in the labor market in the first place. Um, uh, are you even classified as an employee versus an independent contractor? Uh, uh, um, uh, your, your deal at work is gonna look very different uh, depending um, 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 background rules, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, matter immensely as well. The idea is that everything from property law, criminal law, tax law, all might uh, affect things from the value of your business to where you operate it, whether you operate it formally or not, close to your home or far away, how much time you devote to your business, and so forth. So all of these rules have something to do with where people make choices about to work, whether they work at home, whether they work in the market. Okay, another thing, another part of the story here is the idea that rules, legal rules are relational. Um, uh, when we recognize somebody's legal entitlement, uh, we're doing something on the other side uh, too. Legal entitlements work in pairs. When we give somebody a legal power or a freedom to do something, an immunity, um, uh, we're placing some other party under a legal disability. Um, we're either creating a correlative duty or we're curtailing that other parties to stop uh, the other person from doing something to harm them, right? Um, so there's um, a, a kind of connected relationship between legal rights for one party and exposure to risk on the other side. So just think that 
of um, every time we recognize some entitlement, the law is putting a thumb on the scale here uh, on, on the side of one party's in a dispute. And uh, uh, the next thing, um, uh, um, the next thing I would observe is simply that um, uh, all these legal entitlements um, uh, aren't given in nature. Uh, they're uh, uh, not inherent in the rule of law. Rather, they're very often the very thing we need to ask questions about. Uh, uh, um, um, and um, um, let me just try and say something about the importance of property to um, employment. Uh, um, uh, the idea here is uh, that uh, property rights uh, don't merely uh, protect the property owner. Um, uh, um, uh, there are contexts in which um, uh, um, they're not neutral vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis the parties, um, uh, even if we see them as necessary to things like economic growth. And one of those contexts is work. Um, why? Uh, uh, because as a general rule, and certainly this is true of all forms of precarious low-wage service work, which is what we're interested in, um, as a general rule, it's employers or buyers of services that set the terms of the bargain. Uh, there's no real bargaining going on um, uh, uh, people generally work on a take it or leave it basis. Um, why is this so? Well, it's because property law sets the terms of access to resources. It's property law that determines uh, 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 whether um, an owner can um, uh, deny access to others who need uh, resources, food, water, shelter, blah, 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 whether or not she uses those resources themselves. And as a general uh, uh, rule, we know that property does confer that power. Um, so there's an intimate connection here between property rules, how they work, and uh, uh, the terms under which people um, uh, work. Uh, if you don't have property, you're compelled to labor for others. Uh, uh, um, um, and um, we know how to change the balance of power here, uh, at least part of the way, uh, part of the time we do this through labor and employment law um, in the way I've described. Um, but as we saw, um, all this only applies to market work. Um, and for much of um, uh, the work of social reproduction, we've got to um, look elsewhere. Other rules are going to be in play. Um, other rules will affect the balance of power. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next um, slide here. Um, this, I think, is in some sense the other um, uh, um, key, um, uh, uh, and it's deeply connected to the question of winners and losers as well. Um, uh, uh, we construct work uh, and we construct productive and reproductive uh, spheres through law. And, um, that is, uh, legal rules don't just regulate society and economy. Uh, 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 markets and households are themselves legal constructs. Um, that is, they don't exist. Um, it doesn't make sense to think about them separate and apart from the legal rules that define who's in and who's out, um, uh, what powers they have, um, what legal protections they'll be given. Okay, so I just want to draw your attention to the fact that law is operating inside the economy here, um, productive and reproductive, not outside. Um, uh, um, and the same thing is true of the family. Uh, um, uh, all of these rules um, are defining the parties that constitute a family, what their parties are they're governing the terms of exchange, they're setting out the powers of asset holders, they're literally defining what counts as an asset that has to be productive. This is what law does. Uh, this is its critical role in, uh, in, in productive life. Okay, now a few things flow from this. Uh, we would notice, for example, that we could and we do construct many different types of families and markets. Um, um, and uh, 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 their form um, and the powers uh, uh, of their actors can and do change. 
And I guess my point would be that when we change these rules, very often we're also shifting the boundary between production and reproduction, the, uh, the boundary between home and market in some interesting ways. Um, um, uh, we tend to think of those ways um, in, in somewhat limited terms, but um, the possibilities for opening this up, I think, are fairly great. Okay. Let's, um, let's have a look at this by trying to follow what's going on with the work of social uh, uh, reproduction. Um, uh, looking at activities that are both productive and reproductive in the sense that they're both um, sometimes uh, uh, part of the domain of care and sometimes performed uh, uh, for payment. Um, think of it this way, they don't come pre-classified. They're not already um, naturally one thing or the other. And I think here's the thing to watch. Um, it's that what goes on in one domain affects what goes on in the other and what doesn't go on in the other. And uh, whether activities occur in one domain or the other is very often a function of law. Um, okay, so leave from work. Um, uh, um, when employees are entitled to paid leave from work by law, it could be maternity leave, family leave, sick leave, emergency um, uh, medical leave, um, not only do they continue to uh, receive employment income, but the nature of their time um, and work changes as well. Uh, what would otherwise be unpaid work is at least partially converted um, into paid work. And this all occurs through the operation of legal rules. Um, at the same time, the boundary between work and care is shifting. Um, caregiving is no longer purely um, a family matter. It becomes part of the bargain at work as well. And once it's wrapped into the work bar uh, bargain, it may well change how work is organized, right? Uh, um, uh, employees, employers may um, hire more or different workers. They may, may reorganize schedule. Um, work may occur in different locales. There may be more work from home. Um, there are all kinds of possibilities here. Um, the process also works in reverse, however, and this matters too, especially in a world in which policymakers are seeking to make their firms and their economies ever more efficient and productive. Uh, uh, so when laws are changed to give employers more flexibility to allocate their labor resources, basically make workers uh, work um, uh, uh, whenever they need them and not when they don't, the border uh, between home and work can get pushed back in the other direction. And unless wages rise to compensate, which rarely occurs, um, the zone of unpaid work is very likely to expand at the same time. Um, a couple of other examples here. Um, healthcare. Um, it's a, um, a great example. Uh, I, I think all the activities associated with the maintenance of health are um, a great example of um, uh, 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 um, uh, something uh, in which the distinction between production and reproduction um, uh, is neither stable nor especially helpful. Instead, it's the result of the decisions that we make. Um, uh, um, uh, whether it is part of the realm of care or part of the realm of the economy of the market depends on how we organize it. Uh, to what extent is it professionalized and compensated? Um, in every country, um, uh, some forms of health care for some people are going to be compensated, which means they're going to catch as a productive economy. Um, but uh, uh, which activities are up for grabs um, and what is left over is going to fall into the reproductive economy? Um, okay, here's the idea. Um, wherever that law is drawn, and it's drawn differently uh, 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 at, at different moments and in different places, uh, law is going to play a role. Uh, a few people, of course, um, uh, can buy unlimited amounts of health care, but most of us, how much care we get and how much is provided for free by ourselves, by family members, by community members, um, is directly related to whether other, some other party um, is paying for uh, the services too. If one of those parties is the employer, uh, which is uh, the case in, uh, with many people in the United States, for example, then the laws and policies governing work are going to matter immensely to the question of healthcare, the divide, right? Are you an employee? Do you have health benefits available through work? If so, can you afford them? 
Are they mandatory parts of the contract? Are there alternatives in the community um, by the state? Um, all of these things um, are going to determine um, not just the level of care, but where it occurs, whether it's compensated. Namely, is it productive? Is it reproductive? Um, okay, basic idea is that there's not any closed list of what might fall on one side or the other. Um, uh, take the case of childcare. Uh, we can provide it at work. Um, it can literally be wrapped into the employment bargain. Um, it can be paid for by the employer, or it could be paid for and provided by the state, which, which means that the costs don't fall only on um, uh, the individual or the family. Instead, all of us pay as much as we do um, uh, already for education. Now, some version of these arrangements were, um, in fact, standard in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc countries for the simple reason uh, that the animating assumption was that women were engaged in paid work. Uh, but m um, many of these arrangements were eliminated in the transition uh, from plan to market economies after 1989 on various theories that enterprises should concentrate on their core functions, that they were expenditures that contributed nothing to production, that they made firms uncompetitive. Um, the bottom line, they weren't imagined as normal or proper or appropriate parts of the world of production. Okay. Um, I want to just um, uh, uh, talk about um, uh, this idea um, that markets require certain lines um, uh, between production and reproduction. And I want to illustrate that by suggesting that um, this question of reproductive work um, and its relation to productive work can be thought of as a question of what economists call externalities, uh, namely based on uh, good or bad effects on third parties. Okay, so let's just recall two points, namely that we know that reproductive um, contributes, is essential to productive work, to the economy writ large, and we know that the performance of unpaid work remains notoriously maldistributed. Women do more of it, um, sometimes vastly more of it in all known societies. And this has well-documented adverse effects on women's labor market participation. Um, there are a women's capacity to be entrepreneurial, for example. Um, here's what I want to highlight. Um, all of this uncompensated work creates huge benefits for others. If, for example, um, uh, uh, employers can treat the fact that workers have unpaid work obligations, uh, childcare, food preparation, cleaning, whatever, as irrelevant, uh, then they can derive the benefit for free, um, as will other people, and the people who do it will have to do it either on top of or instead of um, uh, their paid work. Um, it's been called a tax on income for this reason. Um, or those who do uh, reproductive work will be disadvantaged or even excluded from paid work. They'll be compelled to derive their economic support elsewhere with all the risks that uh, that entails. Okay, the question of how we might compensate unpaid work um, is um, uh, um, uh, a really complex picture. Um, would you pause for just a second? I think there is gardening going on next door and I better um, close the window. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hi. Yes, um, this is just absolutely fascinating. Thank you. So maybe if you could go over the next few slides um, and sort of wrap up because we're beginning to have lots of questions for you. Okay, brilliant. Okay, um, I, let me just make this one point because uh, it's actually quite critical to, to the argument. And that is externalities are only externalities because parties are entitled by law to ignore them, to treat them as free or costless or limitless, um, to, to treat them without consequences. We understand this. Uh, if we think of the case of clean air or water, um, uh, the minute there's a pollution law, um, a pollution abatement mandate, um, uh, air and water become costs of doing business. They're no longer free. Um, my point is this would be true of virtually every dimension of reproductive work. 
um, uh, um, uh, uh, we can draw the boundary in many places and many things are potentially part of the deal at work. Okay, um, last, um, or the next slide, we'll just try and move things quickly. Um, I think uh, the role of law in legitimating social and economic uh, arrangements. This is, I think, something that people find intuitive and easy to grasp. But I'll, I'll rehearse just, um, uh, uh, just one thing. Um, if, if and when uh, labor and employment rules exclude agricultural workers or domestic workers or sex workers, um, they're not only um, uh, preventing those workers from reaching, uh, from, from protections that are afforded to other workers, the fact that they're legal norms um, uh, uh, conveys that it's acceptable, that it's normal, that it's natural, maybe it's even required. So law plays a, 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 a role in validating all these norms. Okay, so those are the four basic propositions. I wanna just briefly mention um, two other things uh, that matter. Um, at one is the place of informal norms. Um, uh, there's a lot of work to be done um, uh, in my view, to investigate uh, the role of informal norms and how they interact with formal law, because it's clear that in many forms of work, uh, uh, um, uh, informal no uh, norms are governing critical parts of the organization of work. Who does what types of work? Um, who gets what in the way of compensation? Uh, um, um, uh, and um, uh, um, informal norms are going to be very influenced by uh, 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 um, uh, what's going on uh, it, with the normative idea of the family. Um, I think we can see this in the draft wage code that was recently passed in India. Um, uh, it makes reference to a standard list of household expenditures that a minimum wage should be entitled to, uh, should, should cover. And it also makes reference to a kind of normative family. Um, we would query and we do criticize all these embedded norms, uh, but I think uh, the point for us to notice is that um, informal norms, social norms, the family are already there um, uh, uh, in determining the terms of work. And that means we already have a context in which we can think about uh, both formal and informal norms at work. Um, and finally, the last slide. Um, this is um, the importance of interaction between different legal regimes. Um, uh, the idea that rules can have a big uh, imprint, they can work indirectly, uh, but very powerfully, uh, they don't stay in their boxes. Um, uh, uh, property rules um, uh, uh, give property owners uh, immense power over other people. Um, uh, 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 they can evict people uh, uh, from their homes, from their work premises. They can regulate the activities of their tenants. Um, family law doesn't just govern the family. Um, just I'll, uh, give, give one example. Uh, um, the footprint of criminal law and immigration law can be best. Um, in the realm of work. Uh, uh, um, if uh, the visas of domestic workers, for example, compel them to work for particular employers, uh, which happens all over the world, uh, we can predict that some of those workers will end up um, uh, with passports confiscated, they'll be unable to leave, they'll be working under conditions that they did not and would never have agreed to in advance. Uh, uh, so here, the most important rule may actually be immigration law and citizenship law. Um, uh, okay. Um, um, I will wrap up so that we have time to talk a bit more um, and time to take some questions. Uh, uh, let me just reiterate uh, uh, the idea that um, rules uh, can reach down to the ground even from very high up. Uh, 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 trade and investment rules, for example, can end up dis disrupting local economies, local households, um, um, uh, even eliminating uh, entire ways of life. Um, so the, the basic idea is the actual law of the household is, uh, uh, and, and workplace relations um, uh, is found in many, many different places. There's no closed list. And when thinking about social reproduction, maybe we can take this up more in questions. 
um, especially in contexts um, uh, like India, for example, where many workers don't work in standard employment relationships, and in fact, where their working lives are a kind of indissoluble amalgam of both tasks of work and tasks of care, as Bina has, has explained, we're going to have to look further afield. It may well be that subsidies to production in some form are the best way to um, assist the workers who are engaged in reproductive work, instead of trying to figure out whether what they're doing is reproductive or productive when it's both. Okay. And um, uh, thanks, I hope these provide um, uh, some bridges to conversations about what we might do going forward. Thanks. Terry, thank you very much. Um, that's, uh, that's a marvelous uh, lecture. It's amazingly wide ranging. Um, and you, there are so many nuggets of insights that um, I, I'm not sure where one would pick. I think people would have to hear the whole lecture again uh, and discuss uh, sections of it. Um, uh, there is great room for dialogue between economists and, uh, and, and legal experts on this issue. And of course, uh, sociologists and anthropologists as well. And, and some, of the, some of the things you mentioned, for instance, it seems to me that um, there's a, there was an argument uh, throughout that law is everywhere. You said law is inside and not just outside the economy, of course. Yeah. Uh, we know that about markets. But then you also said somewhat controversially, perhaps, bringing law uh, that, that markets and families are legal constructs. Yeah. So, so in a sense, you have, you, you have the pervasiveness of law um, yeah. everywhere. And then you have, of course, uh, social norms, which might one could say mediate. Um, another thing which is very interesting, I think, is uh, the reminder that legal rules uh, are incentives for action. That is, law um, is empowering, a change in law is empowering in and of itself, because people do ask, well, you know, what's the point of law? Uh, it just remains on paper. But I think, um, as, you, as you point out, law, it, laws themselves are endowments in a way. Um, and uh, there you can have factor endowments, land labor capital, and then you can have uh, legal en en endowments um, as well. And, and they become a tool in the hands of activists uh, uh, and, and practitioners uh, to take things forward. Um, so I, uh, there, there are many, there's a third issue you mentioned, which was very curious, uh, which I'm very curious about, the flow of resources along productive and non -produ and reproductive divides. Um, so I, um, I, won't, uh, I, I won't dwell on these. Um, I, uh, Prabha had suggested that I ask a couple of questions. So let me, let me just do that. And then I might ask uh, Prabha herself to say a, a, a word or two. Um, now, one of the questions that, that came to me was this question of agency and choice. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, um, I play the devil's advocate here. So uh, you seem to suggest that somehow um, the state or we or, or whoever is pushing women into market work which is seen as productive work. So you'd say that they are, it's, there's a degree of coercion. You use, use words like you're being uh, coerced into, into that, you're pushed into that uh, direction. And in a sense, um, although you don't say it quite in those words, both capitalist and socialist societies might be, uh, might be doing that. I mean, Engels certainly, who I mentioned, um, thought that let's socialize housework and then women will be part of the market. But my question then is that, you know, are markets so bad? I mean, markets, one could argue, um, bring women's work, give visibility to women's work. If women go out to work rather than just work, work within the home, they, they can form social networks. Um, they, they, they have talents which they would like to use. Um, uh, out, you know, and, and which are in, to do jobs which uh, they are qualified to do. And similarly, one could say that men don't have the choice because of uh, social norms uh, to actually do childcare and housework because of notions of masculinity, um, etc. So um, I wanted to push back a little bit on that. That is it really 
or do we really want women's work at home to simply be valued? And even if you pay some people um, a fortune, they'll say, well, the last thing I want to do is sit and cook um, and, and fetch water all day um, uh, if you're in rural areas. So, so that's one question. Um, and the, the second question was, and I'm posing both together to save time, is that the more we bring in legal securities, we also bring the state into the picture. So, so, so this, is, this is a question that, um, you know, some people might say, well, we don't want the state to be in every aspect of our life. So there's a pushback against the state. On the other hand, there is also an assumption that, um, you know, social security, uh, payment for care work, payment for maternity leave, etc. All of this is something that the state will, uh, will, uh, will take care of. Um, and this might become an issue if we, as, if we move away from the assumption of a benevolent state. Um, so there, there, are, there are some assumptions about how we think of the state and how we think of accountability and, uh, and, and holding the state accountable. Um, is what kind of state are women living in? Does that, how, how does that make a difference? And how much of that do you want entering? Um, into our lives. So, so those, those are the two. Um, uh, Prabhat, should we uh, ask her to address these now or yes, briefly? I think, yes, very briefly. And then we have a few sets of questions which I'm rounding yes. up. But once yes. you respond to these, I will, uh, we can present okay. them. And, and then I the want you to, uh, let, me, let me pose my question to you, Prabhat. Uh, maybe you can, um, because uh, you have actually used concepts like replacement cost and, and opportunity cost um, of women's work in a very interesting concept, context, which is uh, the Motor Vehicles Act, that if people die, and if a woman who dies, if she's, she's a housewife, how do you actually give a value to her? to compensate the family, for instance. I think that takes on a, a very interesting new discussion between economists and, and, and legal experts. So, uh, so I'll leave you to, to, to speak on that. Uh, Kerry, you first. Yes. Great, thank you. Bina, those are, are critical and actually, uh, you know, uh, characteristically insightful questions. Um, uh, and so I'm glad that you asked them. Um, um, so let me just dive in and with, with the, your, your question, are markets bad? Um, and I think the, the simple answer would be no, not necessarily, which is why rather than um, take Nancy Fraser's suggestion that we have to dismantle capitalism wholesale, I took a different route, which was to suggest that markets can and do take different forms and we can organize them in different ways and the ways in which we organize them uh, themselves are ways to actually um, uh, help compensate um, uh, 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 women for unpaid work. And I think here what I would just say slightly more clearly than I did um, in the lecture is the reason it's important to focus on the background rules, for example, like um, property rules and contract rules and various modifications to them, is that those are the rules that um, don't directly implicate the state, but organize private relations, right? And so um, it's not the state in the first instance that we're asking to pay for childcare or maternity leave. There are many possible um, arrangements, but the idea is, um, uh, no, we don't have to be against markets, um, and I'm not against markets. Uh, I'm very much a working woman, and I can't imagine not being one, right? I think the issue though is this. Um, um, uh, um, um, actually, maybe let me ask your other question uh, uh, first. Do we want the state in our lives? Um, uh, and uh, what kind of choices do we want women uh, to be making or to be forced to make? I guess I would start with simply the observation that we're already nudging women in one direction or another through law and policy. It's not a question of if we do it, but how we do it, right? So the rules are there, they're operating as incentives. They're gonna operate as incentives in one direction or another. I think the task is simply to look at them 
what kinds of choices are they encouraging people to do? Um, what kinds of opportunities are they opening up? Are they closing down? I think that is the critical question. We're not in a world in which any structure of legal rooms could not be incentives to behavior for various parties. And so I think it just turned, I would just turn the lens on this a little bit. Um, um, and um, maybe that's an answer to the well-founded worry. Do we want the state centrally involved in women's lives? Um, certainly through a very heavy hand directing who gets what resources and under what conditions. I mean, we've done that. Um, I mean, sometimes we think it's fine. Like most of us don't think it's fine that the, that the state is organizing healthcare, but there are lots of different options. Um, uh, um, I guess, again, I would just reinforce the idea that there are different possible arrangements. Um, uh, law plays a role in organizing powers between private actors as well. And when we think of compensating um, uh, unpaid work, uh, um, um, the only option isn't through the state. Um, there are ways to do it by reallocating uh, powers and incentives through legal rules that will affect how private actors okay. allocate the resources and it'll affect the distribution of profits, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and okay. so that would so, be the idea. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, uh, Prabha, before I turn to you, I just want to, I just want to put this little idea into this public forum because it's, un it's a unique space, which is that in all our discussion, we've been talking about private, care work is done privately. There's, there's the state which provides support structures, however, whatever. What about the third space, which is the community? I mean, isn't it possible for us to begin to talk about communities organizing for elder care and child care as more cohesive units, which, which may be supported by the state, but doesn't require the direct entry of the state, nor does it leave women isolated in their homes to do all the care work. And we, have, we don't really discuss this enough. I've been working on questions of cooperation and community for many long years now and in, in, a, in a productive work context, but it seems to me that that's, that's something um, that we could think about, do you think? Absolutely, yes. I'd be completely in favor of that. And my, my, the only observation or connection I would make to this is that I would be deeply interested in the extent to which people's arrangements in the productive world either enable that or make that extremely difficult and burdensome to do. Um, right. and, and if women are compelled to spend more and more time generating income or if they're nudged or encouraged or if other, other sources of income are closed off, then that's really gonna limit the possibilities for doing things on a volunteer and unpaid basis. I don't think there's anything essentially wrong with unpaid work. The, the, what, the problems come in, okay. yeah. um, how, um, 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 how it's distributed. Yeah. Right, but I'm, let me interrupt by saying that I wasn't suggesting women do all the volunteer, voluntary work for, community, yeah. for building community care. I was thinking of people who we normally say are out of the productive workforce, 60 plus you say, and then you're supposed to be out of the workforce. Yeah. But you know, you're very much there. Teenagers who are out on holidays, why can't they provide Supports. I'm just not thinking of women doing it themselves, but other actors. Anyway, uh, Prabha, did you want to say something now? And there are no. I, I think I will. I'm going to questions because there, yeah. are, there are questions. We go to questions, and if there's time, definitely, I'm very happy to address your question. Um, so the if it's okay, Bina, I, uh, the first set yeah, of go questions. Ahead. I'll just give you sets of three, Kerry. The first uh, set of questions came from Sister Lizzie, who was asking about how, given the pervasive social environment we live in, of patriarchy and the myths that go with it, how can we hold the state responsible for addressing, you know, recognizing the care work of women, and how do we expand that responsibility to international organizations um, such as the ILO and other UN organizations, um, and whether you can present other examples where, in fact, there are there are successes to report in terms of uh, recognition of the unpaid work. So that's the first question um, from Sister Lizzie. Uh, the second one is from Sidney, uh, who asked a wonderful question, uh, two questions actually. One is she's inquiring whether you had concrete examples, either empirical data or theoretical frameworks to address the concept of visibility that comes up repeatedly in your lecture. 
And I think related to it is her query and concern about the humanitarian turn in developmental theory, where she argues that uh, there's much more focus on doing humanitarian work and alleviating suffering, which is you know, visible in front of your eyes, rather than I suppose dealing with the dull compulsions of you know, unpaid work and economic justice. So that's the second question. And then the third question is from Tara, who asks about the increased use of technology in recruiting, remunerating, and monitoring women workers. And I think she means women in the gig economy and how this might confuse the productive reproductive continuum and complicate the legal definition of work and efforts to provide legal protection. So that's your first set of three questions. Thank you, Prabhu. Thanks. Go ahead, Kerry. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me take the last one first. Um, uh, the idea that the increased use of technology um, in uh, recruiting and monitoring uh, uh, women, but I, I would say all workers, um, uh, poses some kind of complication for um, uh, the distinction between production and reproduction. Am I understanding that question correctly? Did I get that right, Prabha? Yes, I believe so, yes. Okay, I totally agree. I totally agree because one of the things that it does is disrupt the boundaries between working time and not working time and working space and non-working space, um, private channels of communication and commercial channels of communication. Um, uh, uh, labor scholars actually are um, working on uh, what is sometimes called uh, the problem of algorithmic management. And, and that is the fact that um, um, all the devices which allow um, Amazon and Uber to monitor um, uh, uh, the flow of their products and services turn out to be very effective means of monitoring and disciplining workers as well, right? So it's clearly right that that's a big frontier and it's got income generating possibilities for people but, um, but we also know that it's got very, very troubling capacities to discipline workers as well. And also these algorithms that organize work uh, are almost entirely under the control of employers. They can be changed at will and workers can and do find um, that all of a sudden, you know, they're working for less money because the algorithm has changed and work opportunities are being allocated differently. So yes, that's a huge frontier. Um, um, uh, I would say um, um, uh, another reason for just diving in and, and, um, and, and looking at, uh, you know, how, how the costs and risks are being allocated, who's in control and who's, um, who's getting the gains and losses. This is a sort of fundamental question that pertains to productive and reproductive work. So yes. Um, um, the second question, are there... Um, empirical uh, um, examples or theorem, theoretical models um, that can help um, explain um, uh, the significance of um, uh, these mundane questions like the distribution of unpaid work. Uh, well, I hope this lecture has helped a little bit in, on the theoretical level in, in, uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that point, but let me, um, let me pick up a thread of your question as I heard it, which is um, there is, and I think you're absolutely right, to notice the intense focus on you know, the extreme situation, the humanitarian crisis, the very worst off, uh, which of course seems compelling, but which very often um, comes at the expense of these ordinary but unbelievably significant issues. So I put myself very much in the camp of those who like to explore uh, not um, the extreme, the horrific, um, but um, both to, to look at the organization of the ordinary day-to-day um, uh, -day life and its problems. Um, but I also um, have a very strong intuition um, one that I wrote about in, in, in the context of trafficking um, in a wonderful collection that, that um, Prabha Kochishwaran has edited, that in fact, um, the extreme problems are almost invariably connected to the everyday as well. 
And so if you take seriously the possibility that solutions to big problems may be indirect as well as direct, sometimes the answer to the really big humanitarian crisis turns out to be solving the more mundane everyday ones as well. Um, at least that's what Do I think. Do you want to give an example, Kerry? Well, um, uh, forced labor, um, trafficking, for example, I think is a good example. Um, um, it's the kind of um, issue that gets an immense amount of um, uh, attention and, and, and usually is subject to criminal penalties and, and, and human rights, um, uh, call for stronger human rights. But, but we know, and in fact, the International Labor Organization knows that an enormous amount of forced labor is actually integrated into global su supply chains. It's part of the construction of this Apple machine on which I'm working. There's very likely to be some components in there that were um, uh, uh, um, produced through forced labor. Um, so um, uh, trafficking and forced labor, we can think of them as marginal problems that we can tackle on their own, and sometimes we do. But they're also a huge part of that, uh, which are part of the general way that we organize um, uh, the production of goods and services in a transnational economy. And the fact that um, the power and control and resources tend to flow up and um, the risks flow downward. So forced labor and trafficking are extreme examples or the extreme ends of what turns out to be a nested problem. Um, uh, um, and if we wanna tackle forced labor, sometimes the best thing to do is to predict that it will show up um, under conditions where workers have absolutely no power and no other options. Um, this is also true, by the way, of um, um, uh, the example I used earlier with um, uh, um, uh, passport confiscation, which is understood to be a kind of forced labor. It happens in Canada. Oh, why does it happen in Canada? It happens because employers um, have very little oversight and because workers' visas are tied to those employers and that makes them very fearful of speaking out about anything going wrong. So um, um, that's an example of if you think this is a problem, you might want to yeah. deal with it indirectly through these other laws and you very often want to see these problems as nested. Sometimes problems get solved together. Right. Thank you. And then do you have the first question? Or yeah, is that how to hold states responsible um, and how to, res uh, how to extend responsibilities to um, uh, international institutions. Well, I guess um, if there's a big message um, behind the lecture, one would be simply the idea that all economic policy is social policy too. Um, um, social reproduction, the terms of social reproduction are produced in part by many, many development policies, many, many economic policies, many decisions. Um, I, I think that's part of the reason for trying to look at all this together, for resisting the distinction, and for, um, for sort of making an argument like that. What if we suddenly saw all these development policies, um, uh, the general policies that we pursue to generate economic growth as intimately connected to social reproduction and its dilemmas? Well, I think we'd see lines of connection that we would otherwise miss. Um, um, and I think, you know, how to extend that responsibility uh, to international institutions? Well, um, I mean, we can, we can see um, um, uh, a couple of instances. The World Bank um, uh, 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 has gender equality and gender empowerment in all of its initiatives right now. Um, um, we can see that the social, um, the sustainable development goals have um, the um, valuing and compensation of unpaid work as an explicit target to advance gender equality. Um, uh, but look what else is happening. Look what else is happening. Um, uh, um, uh, I, th I think what matters is, so how are we going to value this and how is this going to actually work with the idea that you want to foster all this entrepreneurial activity. If you want to do that, and if we think that markets are good, and if we actually want women to be engaged in this activity too, then you can't divorce that. You can't separate that from solving the other part of the equation. This is the unfinished revolution. Um, uh, it's not something you tack off, at, tack off at the end. It's right at the heart. You can't hope to make your project work, and you can't hope to make it work for women if you don't deal with this other thing too. 
Right. No, I, I absolutely agree. I, I think one smaller answer is also that if you look at the UN on this first question, that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are precisely that. So if you look at one of the targets, it's um, measuring uh, unpaid and care work, which, are, which, is in, which, is a direct, which is in the right direction, both to make women's work visible. And in so far as SDGs have been adopted by countries and ratified uh, as, as potential targets, uh, it's, it's a good example of holding countries uh, responsible. Um, at least it will push them to, uh, to do uh, more time use surveys. Um, uh, and and I, think, I think then it's up to us um, as citizens, as, as, as academics, as activists to take it up and use those tools. Um, uh, to, 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 to just, just as you talked about laws, to use those tools to take things, off, things forward. Um, one thing I might add in addition, um, totally in support of all that, and one thing that I've been keeping an eye on for a long time that I think is a critical part of the equation is, is uh, the push that's been around for 25 years um, for more labor market flexibility, to give employers more freedom um, from the costs and risks associated with employment on the theory that that makes them uncompetitive. Whatever we think of that argument, um, uh, whatever its pros and cons, there's no question that um, um, uh, that sort of set of, that policy orientation is not helpful to thinking about rule changes that would empower workers, which would allow workers to organize better, to mobilize for change. It's been directly implicated in the deinstitutionalization of workers' rights um, and collective action in many places, right? So um, that's a piece of the puzzle. If, if we want to mobilize around a different settlement, and I think we all do, and we want to do it by economic means, we want to do it by legal means, then I'm, I'm always interested not only in what they say they're committed to, but what they're doing that might facilitate it or in the alternative impede it. And here's why I'm I'm very much of the view that you want to look at the incentives and the powers that are being allocated um, to capital, to employers. Um, what's that going to do to the deal? How is that going to advance or impede our capacity to get somewhere on this? Right. Thank you. Do you have, do you have time for an, another round, Prabha? Or? I believe so. Quick. Quick round of questions. Okay, uh, and and we will uh, we'll request Kerry to be brief, and then yes. you've got hundreds of papers that they can read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have a friend, Adrian from Brazil, who asks: In what situations would unpaid work uh, could it be considered to be labor analogous to slavery? And a second question on whether the universal basic income would be a way of allowing us all to do more care work. And a third question from Diamond Ashek Bull on wanting you to expand on the metaphor of social reproduction to actually see whether it could be treated legally as an externality in the way um, that you, know, you would have in relation to say pollution or clean air um, as an externality for which the employer or the purchaser of the services could compensate uh, women for doing that kind of work. Okay. Okay, quickly. Um, in what situations might unpaid, might unpaid work be analogous to slavery? That's a very interesting question. I mean, there are contexts in which paid work has been analogized to slavery, uh, 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 namely when uh, workers are being paid less than they're entitled to by legal minimum, where, where they're confined to households and so forth. Um, I, I think it's a question about whether we might uh, describe the circumstances of some women inside of households um, uh, uh, and marriages who are entirely dependent on um, household members for um, all of their resources as um, uh, in a similar situation. I mean, I really leave it to you to decide whether that's a useful analogy. There might be contexts in which it is, but I think, I think that's a question. Um, Could you we, yeah, uh, Kerry, could we link it to the question of agency and choice that I uh, mentioned in the beginning? So even though technically, obviously, uh, women are, uh, although technically you can't call it slavery that easily, but women may experience it 
as such because they don't see themselves as having a choice. And that's why I feel there has to be not just payment for housework, but the opening up of multiple choices for women which are outside the home and outside care work. Um, because it's only by, by empowering them, it's the interactive effect is really about bargaining. So the more likelihood you have of job offers outside, uh, the more you might be able to bargain with your spouse to say, look, it's yeah. going to bring all this income, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you better do more of the housework, for instance. But more than that, a sense of human fulfillment requires that you are able to do, you know, make the choice make the choices uh, that you would like. I mean, Amartya Sen talked it, talked of freedom as, the, as a freedom to choose what you have reason to value. Um, and, 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 and it seems if we don't have that freedom, we, we might experience ourselves. Village women in India often say, well, I'm just a slave. You know, all I'm doing is looking after kids and, and cooking all day. So, so, so the, the, there's a non-economic, non-legal aspect to this, I think. I, I just wanted to make this, I know you would agree with me, but. Um, no, I, 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 no I, I think it's an excellent answer, really. It, it's a beautiful answer. Um, and I think that whether you call it slavery or not, the appropriate focus is on um, choices and options outside the household. What are they? Do women have the, are they in a position to exercise them? The only thing I would add to this debate on the basis of the conversation we've had today is to what extent is law playing a role in structuring those choices? And um, to what extent is law playing a role in structuring the capacity to generate income outside um, uh, the household, which as you so brilliantly demonstrated, you know, is critical to anybody's sense of agency inside. But, but you're now saying it's not only the market and clearly that's correct. So that is our answer. Um, you've just given us the answer there. Okay, <laughs> and, um, good. <laughs> Damn okay. it. So, so the, the other question, very yes, so basic um, can we expand the metaphor of um, externalities? Yes, that was precisely the point of putting the whole externalities point on the table and making it part of the conversation. Um, uh, um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, um, the whole idea is that there are critical inputs and resources that employers, producers are getting for free. Um, we can think of them as externalities, and I think if we do, we've got a basis to considering whether by one route or another, whether directly by the employer, which by the way would just show up in terms of higher consumer prices for the rest of us, um, or, or through the state, we might not want to do that for reasons that other questioners have suggested. We might not find a way to wrap all this unpaid work into the productive bargain. Um, that should be part of it, uh, for sure. Um, uh, uh, and, but only part of it, it'll be, um, there will be other answers. But yeah, I think the concept of an externality and an externality as legally produced, legally ratified, legally supported is a really helpful. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Prabha, did you want to uh, say something on this as well? Um, no, no, not particularly. Either on this. I, either on this or the other um, or, or the other point I'd raised, which is that implicitly we are constantly valuing people's uh, work, um, uh, especially if they're dying. I mean, it, I was very struck by that example you gave that if somebody dies in a motor accident, it's a housewife versus if it's a doctor. How do you how do you deal yeah. with that? Yeah, I think this, this goes to the point about the contingency of, of the law, but also I think legal cultures and, you know, the, the paper that you know, I'm happy to share later is, is really trying to look at the judicial archive in the Indian context on how tort law, it's a perfect example really of what Kerry was trying to get us to think about of how law can redistribute resources. And in this context, Indian courts have used tort law as a mechanism for awarding damages to, you know, uh, dependents of dead housewives. Um, who died in motor vehicles cases to really value, uh, you know, the, the housework, the unpaid care and domestic work that they perform. And I think it ties in also quite closely with the question around slavery and servitude, because I think depending again on the legal culture and the Indian context, uh, calling something for labor doesn't necessarily take you down the criminal law path. It, could, it takes you down the labor law path as any labor which is not paid with minimum wages. So I think one can mobilize 
you know, the, the regime interaction that you so beautifully highlighted for us, Kerry, to really, um, you know, cross fertilize some of these arguments between constitutional law, court law, and labor law to actually then ask for rights for, you know, housewives and for, you know, unpaid domestic and care workers. Uh, but I think one of the, that leads us to one of the questions around the universal basic income as whether that would be, um, you know, a way of, you know, dealing, you know, offering both men and women who are also men who are taking up caring work uh, as remuneration for the kind of work they do. Yes. But the universal basic income argument doesn't actually bring that. I mean, the, the idea is really to provide a floor uh, so that people don't fall below uh, into destitution and poverty. So it, it seems to me as a much more, uh, it's, it's not pitched to pay for, for care work. Uh, in, in, in a way, isn't it? Because right. you suppose, so take Canada, uh, Kerry. I mean, you have a you have a social security system. So would you still argue for universal basic income? Oh, one of the very interesting things that's happened in Canada. In sorry, the context... she lost her. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Have we? Uh, no, she's here. She's here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the very interesting things that's happened in the context of COVID is that. Um, the government very quickly rolled out um, uh, an emergency benefit to um, uh, um, make up for the lost income uh, that people would have as a result of the, um, uh, the lockdown, COVID-induced lockdown. And that's led directly to calls for, so why, if you can do this, why can't we just have a universal basic income? Um, you've just proved that it can be done. Um, uh, there are all kinds of arguments, as you know, Bina, about whether it is a disincentive to work. Uh, but I think uh, that it, uh, whatever its function, um, intended function, and whatever its consequences, among the things that it would do, uh, would certainly uh, uh, put a floor under the conditions of unpaid work as well, right? So in some senses, um, we could, I think it's not um, implausible to think of it as one mode of compensating um, uh, for what is now um, unpaid work. It certainly relieves some of the pressure that those who do it might otherwise feel to go and generate income in uh, the labor market. Um, and, and some of them don't make very much money at all. One of the discoveries was that people actually were making more on the emergency relief benefit than they had made um, working um, in the labor market. So, um, I mean, I, th I think of the UBI um, as an example of just another way to redistribute income. Um, it's through the vehicle of the state, uh, but basically it's just a redistribu redistribution of resources that are ultimately all coming from all of us. Um, it's, it's one mechanism of uh, ensuring some reproduction. It could be part of the solution, uh, but it's certainly far from the only one. Uh, Prava's example was very helpful. I want to just highlight one dimension of it. Um, the mechanism of payment is tort law, and that, again, is a private-to-private -private payment. The state's role is limited to structuring the entitlements and enforcing them, but the actual resource transfer goes private to private. And uh, to go back to Diamond's question about externalities, could you imagine the work of social reproduction as an externality and make employers pay for it? You could. It would have broader economic effects, but again, it's a private to private transfer that's mandated and organized through legal rules. And it's these rules, uh, employment rules, tort rules, property rules, contract rules, that are part of this web of background rules that are in fact organizing flows of resources and that are part, they should be on our radar when we're trying to think of the possibilities of um, dealing with this issue because it's going to look different. Responses are going to be different in different places. So I think the idea is get as many tools on the table as you possibly can and just have them in view as things to think with. And then you can make strategic decisions about whether in India, the better route is this way. Um, in Canada, the better route is that way, whether some combination of things might be a good idea and what we can learn from each other across these different contexts. You know, I think one of the problems with treating this as private to private payments and treating care work as externality that employers would pick up is that employers will just stop hiring women. I mean, this has come up uh, recently, for instance, in the expansion of 
um, uh, uh, maternity leave uh, in India um, and, uh, and the idea that creches should be provided uh, for women by employers. And, and uh, the, you know, the response was that, well, we'll, there's no reason why we should pick this up and we'll just hire women, or we'll just hire men. So I think one has to be, in, in, in talking about this, uh, the, ex, the larger conditions under which this may be possible would have to be extreme um, shortage of labor uh, in the labor market so that you would be willing in order to get that, either you have very specialized labor, you can't do without X or Y because they have such a, they have particular skills, um, or uh, that there is such a shortage of labor that you're willing to pick up higher costs in terms of externalities, to bring that person into the, into the labor force, neither of which conditions actually exist in most developing countries and, and typically not, in, by and large, in most years in developed countries. Uh, so, so I think uh, we need to really uh, see alternative ways so that it doesn't boomerang back because all these laws um, have, we have examples of, of, of coming back. Um, this, is completely, this is completely correct. Um, and again, all we have to do is think about these laws as incentives. Will they encourage employers not uh, to hire women? That's a, a risk. Um, um, I think at the same time as we want to pay attention, that really goes to the questions about how we do it um, as much as whether we do it. So, for example, uh, in Canada, um, uh, uh, maternity leave is protected by labor and employment law, but it's actually funded through the general employment insurance scheme, right? So it doesn't fall on the employer directly affected. And um, it's organized that way for the very reason that you have identified. Otherwise, it functions as a disincentive to hiring women. And you don't want to do that. That's not a good thing. So yeah, there are immense complexities in these organizational decisions. Um, I think the point would be just to expand the range of possibilities here, because Lots of them will work or will work to some degree, um, and um, uh, we want to figure out which ones do. Yeah, I, yeah, I, th I think, you know, on maternity leave, it is very interesting because, of course, the solution then by some countries was that uh, you had non-substitutable um, leave, not parental leave, but um, leave for fathers and leave for mothers, and the fathers couldn't just... So yeah. you know, yeah. uh, yeah. if they didn't take it, they would lose it. Uh, yeah. There is when they gave paternity, uh, where they gave parental leave, women ended up doing most of the most of the childcare. So 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 there could be imaginative ways by which we, one could frame and reframe um, uh, the laws. I think. Yes. Okay. So Prabha, how are we uh, in your good hands? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there are some very interesting questions uh, that we, uh, you know, that we still have. Uh, we still have about 137 people with us. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's a, it's a question of whether we can spend. So enough. we spend uh, five more minutes at yeah. most and, and then, yeah, just to I wind up. And... Good. Yeah. So I think the, the final set of questions, I think we've seen some versions of these. One is interrogating the role of international organizations and uh, you know, promoting women's economic empowerment rather than simply saying, uh, you know, presenting unpaid care work as a barrier to women's labor market outcomes. So the question is, you know, can we think of uh, an, a creative role for international organizations when we are in fact seeing a decline of global governance? And then there are two questions uh, about how uh, once we, uh, you know, there is a tendency of labor lawyers to fetishize productive work and therefore bring it within the ambit of labor law and whether that in fact um, you know, isn't a risky proposition. And the third question around how once you invite the gaze of the state, um, in fact, you know, without having a corresponding voice of, you know, women workers themselves in the lawmaking process, whether we are not just setting up ourselves for, uh, you know, perverse laws or laws that actually don't help. And here, I think Rashmita is using the example of um, sex work laws. Um, and last but not the least, a question about how, you know, when women go out to work in the market, whether we need to think about reconstructing gender and sociological norms, uh, you know, because they are often viewed as sociological males rather than females, 
and um, are we talking only about restructuring the market or but also about social norms that go with you know participating uh, in the market so you can pick and choose any which of those that you want yeah to. I, would, I think uh, i think pick one um uh, perhaps, and then we could leave the other questions to be answered. It's always good to leave uh, questions in the air uh, that people will think about. So, Kerry, it's your choice. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just pick up the gentle provocation about whether, as a labor lawyer, I'm fetishizing the market, uh, because it really connects, I think, up with, um, with Bina's observation that, you know, what's going on in the market is important, it's part of the story, but that's not the only thing we want to think of. Um, 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 yes, you know, it's professional disability. I'll think, about, I'll think about the conditions of work because I study it all the time and I'll see possibilities for reorganizing it and, and see possibilities for reorganizing the powers between employers and labor lawyers uh, because that's what we work on. But um, let me come out as it were and say that um, uh, as much as I'm a labor lawyer, I actually think that when it comes to the law of work, labor law is, um, and, you know, as it historically been configured around the employment and um, around the employment standard employment relationship is too narrow a focus for the law of work, that in fact, um, uh, the idea, and actually it's implicit in this talk, many, many different laws are working on work, um, and uh, the employment relationship is not the only game in town, um, uh, uh, and that precisely for that reason, and precisely because many, many workers are now being effectively turned into independent contractors, this is the status of gig workers, and subjected to commercial law norms, um, we have to open up the gaze and think beyond market work, think beyond labor law. Um, I myself am deeply interested in how work fits within bigger economic structures, how it's imagined in the picture of development, um, the place of unpaid work in that picture, and, and I'm interested in, in, in its legal infrastructure, how it all organizes it. But, um, you know, there's a lot more to be done. Um, maybe this touches briefly on the question of restructuring sociological norms, um, and maybe uh, a good place to end would be, there's so many problems and so many issues at work. The caste and um, racial and ethnic division of labor, for example, which is routine, it happens everywhere in the world. Different people do different types of work and they're hierarchically positioned in labor markets and they're valued differentially. Um, why isn't this a, set, a central subject of interest in labor law? Um, it's, it's all, we only deal with a piece of it. Um, uh, which is, you know, through anti-discrimination norms at work. But that is not remotely adequate to sort of unpack everything that's going on um, in, uh, in the um, racial and ethnic stratification of work as well as the gender stratification of work. So I think that um, uh, more investigation into these um, longstanding social norms and their roots in older legal forms and practices is part of the bigger story, um, and it's actually a project I'm engaged in right now. Yeah, thank you. But would you not say that the discussion on sexual harassment, for instance, um, the the recognition that it's not okay to do X or Y, not just in the in in the formal workplace, but also in the informal. Um, get to workspaces, buses, metros, and so on, um, is an attempt to, to both legally and otherwise change social norms. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. I so, think it's a perfect example yeah. of an issue that, um, you know, the whole issue sort of sprang into visibility uh, through the work of Catherine McKinnon when she wrote a book called The Sexual Harassment of Working Women in 1979, and she made an argument that it should be understood as a form of sex discrimination that was protected under um, Title VII of the US um, uh, 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 law. Um, so yes, I mean, it didn't change the world. It didn't change the world of work immediately, but it certainly catalyzed a set of conversations and transformations, which 30 years later now um, has meant that powerful men, you know, have lost status and position in virtue of doing things that we understand to be harassment, things that used, they used to be able to do with impunity that were simply part of the norms of what you could do as a boss at work, right? So I think, yes, there's a, a powerful and closely intertwined story 
of legal analysis and, and change catalyzed by litigation, which even when it's unsuccessful, does some work on the process of social norms, right? Right. That, thank you very much. So I think um, in winding up, uh, as uh, I used my privilege as a chair to again uh, reiterate that uh, let's think of other institutional forms. Um, you'll have a three-day workshop where, where there's a lot of space to think about this, is that there's markets, there are states, and there are communities. And it's possible for communities to mediate between family and state. Um, by empowering communities. A, a good example of it is when the government of India began to give money, um, uh, funding uh, to uh, shelter homes run by NGOs. J just, just, as an, uh, just as an example. So here what you're doing is you're, uh, you're empowering a mediating body, which is not directly the state. But I, I do believe that uh, communities need to be re reclaimed and transformed again and be held accountable and responsible for, for all of us. Uh, we've moved to we've become too individualized perhaps uh, and, and, and I wonder if law moves us into to individualistic a direction um, and can it, can it move us in a different direction or we, we say there are spaces we want to escape from law and build institutions um, uh, that that uh, that that are not entirely uh, within the sphere of the legal. Anyway, I'll, I'll I will I will leave. Thank you very much for this amazing lecture and an absolutely amazing conversation, um, uh, Kerry. And uh, it's I'm sure if you look uh, at the rest of your Google citations for the rest of the year, every time you give a really inspiring lecture, people read your work. <laughs> um, but uh, I hope people will read Kerry's work and also Prabha's work because they um, uh, she works um, also particularly on India. Yeah, and I just managed to glance at this particular paper, but I look forward to reading both your paper work over, over a period of time. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for being part of this great conversation, uh, which uh, for many of you will continue, right? Um, uh, in, in, in this workshop. It's a great project, Prabha. And we'll be, this is only the first lecture. So it's like seeing a, a, a first book as being a bestseller, and then we look forward to more. Um, so, so, so thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it as a, as a chair. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Prabha. And thank you for all the friends and colleagues who joined. And take care and be safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, a recording of this lecture and this conversation will be posted on our website in due course. And we'll certainly send it out to everyone who's registered um, for, for, the, for the lecture. And thank you so much to both Kerry and Bina um, and to Jesse for uh, helping put this together. I mean, I think one often dreams of this kind of interdisciplinary conversation. And I think it's been a dream come true today, um, you know, both because, you know, Kerry gave us a brilliant lecture and Bina engaged with it so thoroughly. And I think there was some, you know, it's just fascinating to bring our toolkits together and, you know, open up and examine and compare and, um, you know, to, to carry on this conversation. I think there were some deep tensions around how lawyers and economists think about about many of these questions around work. Uh, but I hope, as you said, Bina, that this would be the first of many occasions to revisit uh, some of our deeply held assumptions within our disciplines okay. and learn from each other. Thank you all very, very much. And thanks to our very patient audience. Hopefully next time we'll have you participate more vocally. Thank you. <laughs>